Uh, we've been uh, studying the topic of money for a couple of weeks. Today is our last study, and um, just to let you all know also, um, next week, a lot of you know uh, Cisco and Missy Alcazar, and uh, Cisco has been pastoring refuge in American Canyon, and um, he, for many, many years, part of our church here at Cornerstone, worship leader in that. Uh, we're, uh, next Sunday, we're doing a church swap, and so I'm going to be teaching there. He's going to be here teaching, so uh, he's also going to be leading worship, so you guys will be blessed, and uh, so just to let you know. The week after that, we're going to be starting the Gospel of John and going through the Gospel of John together. So that's the plan for the near future. This morning, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 um, as we kind of conclude this little three-part series that we've had. We've talked about not worrying about money. We've talked about not being fearful of not having enough to get through life. We've talked about the dangers of greed. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about giving, and giving is a part of the Christian life and um, as I said last week, uh, one of our pastors was approached recently, real honest, uh, curious question by someone, and they were wondering, why are you teaching about money? Is the church financially in trouble? And we're so blessed to say, no, we're not. And that's not the purpose. The purpose here is just to, to, to give a little bit of a mini focus on this very important uh, aspect of our finances, our, our material possessions, and what we do with them. Um, Wrong thinking about money can get a family in terrible debt. It can uh, enslave them to creditors and banks. Um, Statistics show that sometimes uh, married couples start fighting over money, uh, even get divorced over money. Uh, We've all heard about the wars of inheritances, inheritance uh, that's left for, you know, relatives, siblings, and family members fighting for such things. Um, So... Money can have a real negative side to it. Money can be a great blessing. It's just simply a tool. Uh, Think of it, you know, any any kind of tool. If I put a hammer in my hand and I can drive a nail or I can smash my thumb, one or the other, you know, the hammer is just the tool. And so we need to be wise about how we see our finances and how we use them for God's glory. So let me read here. We're just going to look at nine verses together today, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. Let me read. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll dive in. Kind of one of the tricky parts for me as a teacher is that whenever we kind of enter into, into something, you're just kind of getting on an on-ramp and you're suddenly on the freeway. The Apostle Paul here, we're catching him mid-thought once again. Uh, 2 Corinthians, of course, one of the letters to a church. He's been saying a lot of things and we're kind of just jumping on the on-ramp suddenly, so kind of catching him mid-thought, but we'll, uh, we'll shake it out and see what we get. So, verse 1 here, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you also abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that uh, this whole thing revolves around you. Everything that we do is because of you, it's from you, it's for you, it's about you. You're the example, you're the inspiration. Lord, I pray that that every dollar that will ever pass through our hands will pass through our hands with consideration of you about what you'd have us to spend it on or, or save it for. And so may you be the great financial advisor that we need, Lord. May you, may you be the one, Lord, regardless of what the experts tell us, may you be the one 
that is over our finances, over our material possessions, our cars and our homes and all the things that we own. May you be the one that uh, directs us how to spend these things that you've let us have and let us use. And may we, may we give ear to you. So thank you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Let me just read through my notes here. If, if you want to follow along the background here, excuse me, as I said, we're catching Paul mid-thought, and uh, he's been having a long-going conversation with his church at Corinth. He is speaking to the church about Christian giving, about the motives, duties, benefits, and blessings of, of giving your money to the work of God. A large part of his work during the third missionary journey was to receive a, a relief offering. There was a Christians in Judea, Jerusalem area, and um, there was a famine going on and there was a lot of Christians under hardship. And so the Apostle Paul was, a lot of what he was doing on his third missionary journey was gathering money and, and taking that money to bring actual humanitarian relief to the church there in Jerusalem. But he had more than just physical blessings in mind. He saw this as an act of unity. And we don't have time to kind of develop this thought too much, but he says in the book of Romans in chapter 15, as you know, the church was born in Jerusalem, there in Acts chapter 2. And so he's appealing to these, to these Corinthian Christians, and they're, they're kind of in Western Europe area. He's appealing to them. He says, if you are the debtors, if you have received blessings from the church in, in Jerusalem, if Christianity started there at the, at the church in Jerusalem, and, and people went out and shared the gospel, including the Apostle Paul, and he says, if you've been blessed by them spiritually, how appropriate it is that you bless them back financially, physically. And so he's also showing here the rightness of blessing those who have contributed to your life, but he's also speaking in other places, and I'm just tying a bunch of loose thoughts together, trying to bring some cohesion to this thing. Culturally, there was a great divide in those days. There was Jewish Christians, there were Gentile Christians, and culturally, before Jesus came, they were just at odds all the time. But since, Christian, since Jesus died on the cross for our sins, people got saved, both Jews and Gentiles. Now they were one in Christ. So he's saying it's not only right for you to show financial support for those who blessed you spiritually, but it's also right as a show and a demonstration of love and unity. So there were a lot of reasons that the Apostle Paul here is saying it's right for you to invest in these saints, in the lives of these saints, real flesh and blood people that have blessed you and that you are one with by faith. So catch you up on the background there. There seems to have been a delay in gathering funds. If you look at the notes, what had been the delay in gathering relief funds? Probably the low level of spirituality at the church. We know from First and Second Corinthians that they were a carnal church. They were a gifted church, but they were a carnal church. And it's very interesting to me how you can have gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and words of knowledge and all these things and still be very fleshly. And so this this gathering of funds goes back quite a ways even into the book of 1 Corinthians. There had been a need there for some time. The Corinthians had said, yes, we'll help. And then they didn't. And so Paul is kind of urging them, hey, you've had good intentions. You abound in so many things. You're a church that is so blessed. You're saved. God is working among you. And you had very good intentions to help but you kind of dropped the ball. Now let's get back on track again and let's gather those funds and let's send them down to those people that are literally going without. And that's kind of the background of what's going on here. So the need was still there, but the Apostle Paul is, is very careful about how he addresses it. Uh, there's a lot that could be said and my mind is spinning right now, but uh, so when my mind starts spinning, it's better for me to just stick, stick to the notes. So I'm just gonna stick to the notes because <laughs> just so many... Th th I don't know. That's just how I work. I, you don't care. It's not important. <laughs> we have quite a conversation in here, let me tell you, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> roll with it, yeah, yeah. What, what I want to communicate today is that in Christian giving, the Apostle Paul here calls it a grace. The word grace means, first and foremost, God's undeserved 
favor for man. You know, when Christ died for my sins, I didn't deserve it and I wasn't, I wasn't looking for it. When I became a Christian, I wasn't looking to become a Christian. I knew things were not as they should be in my life and I started hearing about Jesus, so on and so forth, and finally at age 16, just kind of threw up a prayer and said, okay, if you're up there, I'm ready. And I really did mean it and I didn't know a whole lot, but I really did mean it and Christ came into my life and at different times I've stumbled forward and at different times I've walked forward and sometimes I run forward. It's always been forward, usually. It's a lot of stumbling, but he's, he's revealed himself to me. He's revealed himself to many of us. And God wants to convince us in our minds that what he's doing in our lives is from him. And this idea of giving, it's a call to grace. The grace of God in my life to give me something that I didn't deserve. He gave me eternal life and I didn't deserve it. He gave me a desire to follow him and I didn't have it. He gives me the ability to follow through when I don't have the ability. Yes, I have to respond in faith and yes, I have to put forth effort, but he is the origin of all those things. Now, why would a person want to give money away to people that they don't know? Why would people want to give hard-earned cash, hopefully hard-earned cash, to a church or an organization or a relief fund or some, to help people on the other side of the earth or when there's a tsunami or a hurricane? Why would people want to do that when there's needs here, when they have hopes and dreams for their family, when they want to send their kids to college, when there's a baby coming, when there's an opportunity, if they just get a little more, they can put a down payment on a house and maybe kind of stabilize their future. Why would somebody want to do that? And what Paul said is going to say here and what he's going to be telling us is this. God has given you a grace to do that. He's gifted you with a desire to do that. Anybody can give to any organization. And I get phone calls and probably say to you, I tried to get on the do not call list. Did you guys, have you guys tried to do that? I get phone calls all the time asking, people asking for money. And it's like, how did you get my number? Isn't there somebody I can call? And by the way, if anybody knows, tell me, because I really don't, I don't like those calls. But there's a lot of needs. There's this fund and that fund and the other. There's all kinds of funds and legitimate needs. So people give to legitimate needs, a cancer fund or this relief fund or that. Re- you know, there's a lot of needs out there. And unbelievers give to these things. And people without God and atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Hindus and you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of people give, to, give money to things. But with the Christian, it's with a different mindset. It's, it's with the mindset of I'm not just relieving physical suffering here. I'm investing, Lord willing, in something eternal. God, take this thing and do more than, than feed somebody and provide shelter. Bring eternal benefits, Lord. May these people come to know you. May their hearts be changed. May their hearts be healed. How do we have that mindset? How how do do you take your money and actually give it to somebody? With a hope and with a prayer, Lord, use this. I really can't even afford it, but I'm prompted by you. Use it, God. Take this thing and multiply it, Lord, not just in dollars and cents, but in, in hearts and lives being changed. The Apostle Paul here is telling us that when, when, when we as Christians, if you as a Christian have a desire to give of your stuff, your money, your, your resources, your material possessions, that God has given you a gift to, to want to do that and to actually be able to do it. It's above just, it's above a telethon or something like that. I'm not trying to minimize anything else out there. It's, it's more than just somebody soliciting. It's more than the Salvation Army. It's more than just, oh, these people are gonna keep pestering me, so here's some money and just quit bothering me now. And It's more than that. It's a desire. It's a belief. It's a sacrifice. And so he tells us these things here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let, let's, let's, work, let's work through the text here. I already kind of worked through uh, the first part here. Interesting, though, the word grace is found nine times in chapters eight and nine. And and when you think of grace, once again, think of gift. Think of the word gift. The grace of God is a gift from God. But the grace or the ability to give is also a gift that God has given to the Christian. God gifts you with a willingness to be liberal and generous. And once again, I, I, I do not want to minimize those who are not Christians and, and, the, and a lot of the good things that they do, foundations and hospitals built and all of that. 
But a person who's not a follower of Jesus can't give with the same attitude, with the same mindset, because they just don't dwell in the same spiritual realm. They don't have a desire for for the eternal kingdom of God. So, the word grace here is found often. Let's look at verses 1, 6, and 7. Begin to emphasize these things as we work through. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed or given to the churches of Macedonia. He says, I want to tell you, God gave some churches a gift. Now he's going to explain that gift. Verse 6, we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Titus was the guy collecting the money. So Paul says to Titus, I want you to go to Corinth, and I want you to complete this work. But I want, Titus, I want you to go to Corinth, and I want you to bring to fulfillment and bring to completion the gift that God has bestowed upon the Corinthians, the gift of giving. Go there now and collect the money. They've been intending to do it. They haven't followed through, but they still have that intention. Now they have an opportunity. I'm sending you. Complete the gift. You ever have a desire to buy somebody uh, a Mother's Day gift? and you just don't get it done, and then everybody's gathered at the house, and you're like, oh, I had intended to. I mean, that's a great intention, you know? I mean, you should bless the moms, or you know what I'm saying, birthday gift, whatever it is. Oh, I had intended to. Intentions are good, but how great is it when you follow through? It's great. It's more better, don't you think? It's more better, right? They needed to follow through. They needed to follow through with the giftedness that God had given them to be willing to give. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> but as you abound in everything, this, this church had a lot of stuff going. As you abound in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, that's a lot of abounding. These guys were like, had letterman's jackets, you know, with all these patches on them of, I, we abound in faith, speech, knowledge, diligence, love. He says, see that you abound in this What? grace. God has given you a gift to want to give. Follow through, the Apostle Paul is saying. Some commentators would say that the Macedonians, the Macedonians were one of the churches here, that they were givers because they were appreciative of, the, of, the God, of God's grace to them. Undoubtedly, that's true. But there was a willingness to give. God had given them a willingness to give. Look at verses 1 and 2 here. They were, they were able to give in spite of not having a lot to give. Look at verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. We're telling you about how much God gifted them with an attitude. How many of you know merciful people? Raise your hand. How many of you know extremely merciful people? That's a gift from God. How many of you know extremely helpful people? So on and so forth. Generous people, giving people. You know, some people give, and then some people just really give. Why? Because they've really been gifted by God to have a heart to say, how can I invest my money to help that guy, that gal, those people, that missionary, that relief organization? And a lot of times the people with the gift may not even have the gift of knowing how to make much money. That's even more interesting to me. A lot of the most generous people are giving very sacrificially. And we see that here in verse 2. Let me read verse 1 and 2 again. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. These guys had a great trial of affliction. They didn't have just trials. They had severe trials. This was a church that was hurting. Look at the words there, deep poverty in verse 2. Look at your notes. This is a, this is a, a actual definition of that little phrase, deep poverty. A beggar who has absolutely nothing with no hope of getting anything. These people weren't giving because they had leftover money. They didn't have enough money for themselves. But they were people that were gifted 
with an attitude to give part of what they had. I just want to point it out again. Great tri- out of verse 2, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. God had, had given them a gift to be able to say, well, it's usually mac and cheese, but, you know, uh, we're going light on the cheese this week. <laughs> hamburger helper without the hamburger, here we go. Somehow we're going to make it, you know. Th- these weren't people that were cutting out recreation and, and vacations so that they could give to somebody. These were people that were just barely making it. And yet, you know, they didn't feel that their arms were twisted. They didn't feel anybody pointing a finger in their face or hassling them or anything like that. They, they looked at the situation and they just said, well, we don't have much, but we have more than they do in Judea. And God has gifted us and we love him and we're thankful for our salvation we're thankful that our lives are changed and we believe God's going to take care of us and we don't have much, but they need it. So here, take some. The point here, Roman numeral number two on the second page of your notes, they had grace to give in spite of circumstances. I've heard people sometimes over the years say things like, as soon as my family is financially secure, we can really begin to support some missionaries or as soon as, as, soon as we get these things paid off. Or, you know, and I'm not here to kind of wrangle with you or wrestle with you about how you handle your money and I don't want to know how you handle your money. And by the way, you know, just to let you know, I don't know who gives what here. I have no idea and, it, and we planned it that way from the very beginning. I was taught a long time ago, don't count the money. <laughs> So I know, I've never seen one check pass through here, so I'm free to talk to all y'all, okay? I can just throw it out there, and I'm not, I'm not thinking, of, I'm not looking at anybody's direction because, you know, I don't have the goods on you. I don't want, you know, it's not, not my business. But we just partake of, of the grace of God, and we, and we begin to understand, Lord, you've blessed me so much, and you've given me grace to give. And with the Macedonians, they didn't even have that much that God had put it in their hearts. And so once again, they weren't going without vacations. They were probably maybe even skipping a meal. And all this stuff has to be worked out in our own hearts, as, Paul, as the Apostle Paul says, in fear and trembling. And under Roman numeral number two, I kind of coined a phrase. Their giving was truly a work of God's grace. It was grace giving. They were able to give freely because God had given them more than just a human desire. This was way past human desire. This was, this was supernatural desire that God had given them. They had grace to give enthusiastically. Look at verse three. I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Now this is amazing. Verse four. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. It is possible to give generously, but not enthusiastically. There are some people that will cut a check for something, and it'll be a big check, but their heart's not in it. These guys were giving enthusiastically. Their hearts were in it. They needed no prompting to give. In fact, look at verse 4. I was going to make a joke about this is every preacher's dream, but I'm not going to, because it's not my dream, it's truly. I have other dreams for our church, and this, this is not one of them. But look at, look at what they said, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Guys, I, if you've ever been in a church situation where the, where the pastor said, dig deep, I apologize. If you've ever been in a church where pastors have locked the doors and said, we're going to take another offering, God put it in my heart that there's 10 of you out there that are going to give $1,000 each, I apologize. God's not broke, is he? God doesn't need your money. The Bible says the cattle on a thousand hills are his. What he wants is our hearts. And a lot of times our hearts are connected to our wallets and our purses. But he wants your heart. He doesn't want or need your money at all. But here is a church, guys. The Apostle Paul is not having to say, okay, we're going to receive an offering they're raising their hand and saying, can you cut the sermon short? We want to give money, pastor. 
Look at verse 4. There it is. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They were asking to give. In fact, the word imploring, they were begging to give. Paul, we want to give. Please, we want to contribute to this thing. Look at verse 4. The fellowship of ministering to the saints. Their giving was an act of ministry to other Christians. It's really important that you see that. Fellowship of ministering to the saints. Fellowship is participation. Ministering to the saints is we're helping people, flesh and blood people. Look at your notes if you would. Under Roman numeral number three, number nine. Grace not only frees us, grace to give. Grace not only frees us from our sins, it frees us from ourselves. The grace of God opens your heart and it opens your hand. What in the world? I, I can't outgive God. He's, I can't even believe my life sometimes. My friend Roby Dukes used to say, I think God, I think you got me mixed up with somebody else. You're blessing me too much. I can't believe what you've given me. And when, when we are amazed at the grace of God, when we sing amazing grace and we really mean it, we, we don't walk around with clenched fists. We all walk around with open hands. Right? Yeah, uh, yes or no? Yes. Oh, that was good. <laughs> I think we're going to end on time today. <laughs> God had, God, they, they were so amazed at the grace of God. It's like, Lord, whatever, whatever I have is yours. It's not mine. And I have more than these guys, and they need it. It was a beautiful thing. They were radically motivated. Finally, verses 5 to 9. Jesus is the example that the Apostle Paul uses. And this they did, the Macedonians, not as we had hoped, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. That's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful verse. First they gave themselves to God, and then they gave themselves to us. Let me say this and let me go on record. If your hearts, you know, if you feel like coming to church should include giving money, but your heart's not in it, keep it. Please. Don't want, don't want one dollar in the box if your heart's not in it. God can, God can provide for our church. What if, what if, what if our budget went, got cut in half? Well, the pastors would get part-time jobs and we'd work part-time. What if it got cut down to 25%? Well, we'd work full-time and then we'd, you know, we'd meet with you when we can. And what, what if no money came in? Well, then we'll meet at the park and find some rich person and meet in their barn during the winter. I don't know. You know, we, you know I thank God. You know, we don't, oh boy, all those conversations are coming. Out. I thank God for the freedom that he's given us here. I really do. If we have money, we spend it. If we don't have money, guess what? We don't spend it. <laughs> we don't go into debt. Church has never been in debt. And it's just so wonderful to be free in the Lord to just trust that he's going to provide for things. It's just beautiful. Jesus is always the example. Verse 5, this they did not as we had hoped, but first they gave themselves to the Lord. Guys, give yourselves to the Lord. If you give yourselves to the Lord, your money will follow where God wants it to follow, your time, your cars, your properties, your possessions, they'll follow. Our great desire as a pastoral staff and, and the, the leadership of the church is that you give yourselves to the Lord. Not that you put money in the box. If you put money in the box and somehow feel like, well, I did my duty, I would consider that a failure on my part. Give yourselves to the Lord. And then your whole life follows. Verse 6. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would complete this grace in you as well. They needed to follow through. Once again, Paul calls it a grace. Verse 7, But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Once again, he calls it a grace. Jesus gave himself for us. Look at your notes, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. I need to give myself to him and everything that comes within my sphere of, of life. 
Verse eight, I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. He's just saying simply, look, you had intended to do this, others have followed through, we just encourage you, follow through. He wasn't arm twisting them, he wasn't heavy handed with them. But sometimes we do need an exhortation, don't we guys? You've, you've heard the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You guys have heard that phrase. I'm trying to morph it here on the spot, but uh, Christian service is paved with good intentions. <laughs> supporting a missionary, supporting Gary and Carrie, helping them build a house, which we're going to try to do this summer. You know, a lot of good intentions perhaps on people's parts, but things have to be followed through. I just want to encourage you. I, I just say this. If the Lord's speaking to your heart about something that you've intended to do financially, you bless a family in the church. Maybe a couple that you know is struggling. Maybe you've been intending, I need to have McDonald's coupons in my pocket so when I meet homeless people, I'll have it. I've been intending to help. How many of you guys know where to find homeless people in town that you run into regularly? I know, I know. I see them. How, how wonderful it is to have a coupon ready in your car, ready in your purse or in your wallet or whatever to follow through on that thing, to maybe be able to say, you know what, God bless you, he cares about you. And then just leave, it with, leave that with that person and let God just somehow get to that person and maybe another Christian, maybe another Christian, whatever the case may be, how important it is that we follow through with our intentions. And like what I was saying before, it's a great intention to have, to say I'm gonna get my mom something for Mother's Day, but I sure feel blessed when I do, <laughs> right? And you feel blessed when you do follow through, guys. And so he's saying here, follow through. Finally, verse nine. If you have any questions, let's, let's shoot them in here and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this thing up. Here's that word grace. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the goodness, the undeserved favor, the undeserved merit, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. He stepped out of heaven, he stepped out of the worship of angels. There was no confusion in heaven who he was. He took on flesh, he was born of a questionable birth. Pregnant teenage mom, born in a stable, misunderstood his life, called a friend of wine bibbers, called demon possessed, forgive my language, called a bastard. We know who your mom is, but we don't know who your dad is. He suffered tremendously, the creator of all things, being radically misunderstood, not worshiped, but killed. And it was all of grace for you, for me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, he became poor so that you, do you have a better family because your parents were Christians? Do you have a better life because of a Christian grandparent or a friend or a boss? Somebody, you know, one of the guys that gave me a job early on in life as a young adult, when I really was wandering through life, he hired me as a plumber. You know how much I knew about plumbing? Zilch. I knew nothing about plumbing. And he put me on the end of a shovel and a pick, but the guy was a Christian. I, and I knew he was a Christian, and I went and knocked on his door one day, and I, this is emotional for me. Mr. Poe, I said, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I need some direction. He says, come to work for me. And he had an influence in my life. He didn't need to give me a job. He, he could have hired, you know, Talented guys, <laughs> qualified guys. But his grace was extended to me. And I knew it was because he was a Christian. Jesus, by, by his grace, though he was rich, he became poor so that you could become rich through his poverty. Guys, when that, when that grips your heart, you don't own your money anymore. May it grip your heart. May it move you to have an open hand. Open heart will have an open hand. Any questions for, it, for us today? Look at that pile of money there. Wow. 
Is there a young adults group? Yes, I would like prayer for my walk with Jesus. Thank you, God bless. Contact the pastor's staff and we will direct you in, into their direction. We'll put you in their direction. And if you need prayer, there's prayer cards in the pews. Put them in the offering box with your check. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. Let's stand together. Our greatest desire, you know, John the Apostle said in 3 John, my greatest joy is that my children walk in truth. That was his greatest joy as a pastoral staff and in the hearts of many of us. It's our greatest joy to see somebody following Jesus. That's the most important thing. And so if you haven't been, we'd love to pray for you. If you are, we'd love to pray for you. If you're running, we want to pray for you. If you're running with him or running away from him, we want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord, so much for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you willingly became absolutely poverty-stricken, desolate. Even the 12 forsaking you at, at your arrest, Lord. You, you died alone on the cross, Lord, so that through your par- poverty, we could become rich, Lord. You made us rich, Lord, and we're grateful, and we're, we're, we are amazed at your grace, God. And so, Lord, may you like a waterfall, wash over us with that truth that we, ha- we are a tremendously gifted and blessed people. And as a result, Lord, may we walk with open hands and open hearts. Be glorified in our lives, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you guys. Happy Mother's Day, ladies.